Hello, my name is Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. We're going to be speaking about bedside ultrasound during this talk and focusing on DVT or deep vein thrombus. There's uh, two major questions. Whenever we perform point of care ultrasound, we'd like to focus on a basic clinical question. And for DVT, those questions are the common femoral vein compressible and is the popliteal vein compressible. So there's a fair amount of literature on this. This is just one of many studies, uh, one of the earlier studies demonstrating that point of care sonography can be uh, fairly accurate and fast. And um, this is in the hands of emergency physicians. Um, this study demonstrated that two-point compression technique that we'll describe during this talk was effective. And again, the two-point compression technique meaning that uh, the common femoral vein was compressed and the popliteal vein was compressed. There wasn't even any Doppler used. So that form of study had 98% uh, correlation with uh, duplex sonography formed by radiology. And if you're interested in reading the fine print, uh, this study actually would argue that um, the studies that were false positive and false negative respectively um, was actually correct in the hands of the point of care physician. So why can we get away with looking only at the femoral vein and the popliteal vein when there's so much other vein in between that uh, we might miss a segmental DVT? So this study, fairly old study from the Archives of Internal Medicine, um, took a look at uh, somewhere over 400 patients and actually <clears throat> mapped out where their DVT was. So they found 10% uh, of patients, for example, that we see here on the left-hand side, had only a popliteal clot. Um, the vast majority of patients, or the most common presentation, I should say, was a clot in the popliteal and superficial femoral vein that we saw at 42%. And on down the line, they basically mapped out the locations of each of the clots in each of the patients um, in this study. And as it turns out, if you only imaged the femoral vein and the popliteal vein, you would have captured every one of these patient groups because every one of them had a clot in one area or the other. Now, if you speak to the director of a vascular lab at a major academic institution, they'll tell you that looking at hundreds and hundreds of patients per year, um, that uh, they see on occasion segmental DVTs. So we're going to move forward with the rest of this talk um, knowing that there is a chance with this technique you could miss a segmental DVT. Um, it's a very rare occurrence. Um, many centers don't report seeing them at all. And some authors um, argue whether, the, whether they have much clinical significance or not. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind as a potential limitation of this technique moving forwards. So what is the technique? We're going to use a high frequency linear transducer. You may refer to that as a linear transducer, a small parts probe, your vascular access probe. Basically something with a high resolution that's going to give you a lot of detail for superficial structures. It's a limit exam, two sites, and we're going to test the compression of the vein. So um, externally rotating the leg helps us visualize the femoral vein, and the popliteal vein is going to be visualized best either having the patient bend their knee and sneaking the probe up underneath it, kind of holding the probe upside down, or having the patient hang their leg over the edge of the bed. That helps as well because it dilates the vessels. So here's a picture of a couple of examples of high-frequency linear probes. Again, the higher megahertz is excellent for um, good visualization. In a patient with um, a lot of um, uh, edema, especially in the lower extremities, is one of the reasons why we might be interested in looking for DVT um, assessment to begin with. Some people use um, a frequency range on the lower end of this to get a little bit more depth, especially for deeper vessels in the leg. So here we can see an externally rotated leg and the probe position for the um, common femoral vein localization. Um, this actually demonstrates probably something a little bit too distal. We, uh, you'll see when you start to look at the femoral vein how quickly below the inguinal ligament, how soon the uh, common femoral vessels start to bifurcate into the superficial and profunda, both on the arterial and the venous side. So you really want to be right at the uh, level of the inguinal ligament in order to see the common femoral vein. So here we are level of the common femoral vein. Schematic on the left-hand side demonstrates how high up we are. We're right at the level where the um, femoral artery and vein have not yet bifurcated, but we see the uh, saphenous vein as the first uh, tributary coming off of the common femoral vein. So this is about how proximal we want to be, and you see an image something like this. So here's uh, another example of what it looks like. On the left side, we see the femoral vein and the femoral artery. Notice the artery is much more round, has a brighter wall, and it um, is going to be less compressible. And with a bit of pressure, the femoral vein disappears. The femoral artery might deform a bit, and in real time, you'll often see it pulsate. So no compression on the left side, 
and compression on the right side. It's very important to uh, rule out DVT at a particular location, a particular segment of vein, that you are able to get the walls to fully compress. If the walls can't fully compress anterior to posterior, then you haven't ruled out a thrombus in that area. And often that's going to be the only sign that there is a clot, is the fact that it won't fully compress. So schematically, we see overlaid onto here common femoral vein, common femoral artery, and the disappearance of the femoral vein with pressure. Um, a bit further down the leg, we can see the um, femoral vein has uh, bifurcated, and we can see the superficial femoral vein um, here, and the superficial and deep femoral arteries. So the arteries have already bifurcated, even um, just uh, this proximal in the leg. Going a bit further down into the knee, we can uh, place the probe in the popliteal fossa, uh, typically with the probe facing the patient's right-hand side, so the probe's actually going to be upside down. And um, usually holding the probe right up in the popliteal fossa is helpful. Having the patient bend their knee and try to relax their uh, leg a bit uh, is helpful if they can't lay over the edge of the bed and let their legs hang down. So here, at this level, what we'll see is the vein, which will be the um, more superficial uh, structure and the artery is going to be deeper. So um, one of my colleagues, Chris Fox from UC Irvine, likes to say the vein's on top in the pop. Um, and for some reason, that just helps people re remember it. So uh, vein on top and the artery beneath. And here we can see the popliteal vessels without compression and the arrow near the bottom of the screen is pointing on the left-hand side to the, uh, portal, the um, uh, popliteal vein. And on the right-hand side, we see with some compression, the artery remains and the vein is now fully compressed. So there's no DVT in this location. So just with these two simple maneuvers, placing the probe around the inguinal ligament and compressing the femoral vein fully, placing the probe around the level of the popliteal vein and compressing that vein fully, you can rule out DVT uh, with an accuracy, again, that approaches the accuracy of formal duplex sonography uh, performed in the radiology department. So here again, we see how um, uh, typically sonographers measure uh, the vein. You're, you're not really measuring the vein. What we're doing is showing a split screen where there's no compression on the left and there's compression on the right. So the calipers placed on the edges of the femoral vein really just map where it is because the anatomy distorts a lot with the compression. So we see the artery labeled here, um, but the calipers, we typically don't do that on the screen, although you can, um, the, the vein with calipers, and then on the right side you demonstrate the vein with the calipers essentially touching, demonstrating complete compression. So Doppler can be used. Um, it, uh, the, the, again, the bulk of the diagnostic accuracy, even in the radiology literature uh, for DVT, comes from an assessment of compression alone. Um, but uh, augmentation and respiratory variation are often employed, especially in radiology departments. So it's worth speaking a little bit about what they mean. So with uh, augmentation, we place the uh, Doppler uh, gate within the vein and we see that there's some flow within it as uh, demonstrated by these, uh, this graph along the horizontal line. Uh, at some point you then squeeze the calf distal to the area that you have the probe, where, where you're holding the probe. So for example, probe in the popliteal fossa, or here in this case in the femoral vein, and then you can squeeze the calf. You squeeze the calf, it causes an augmented venous return because you've squeezed the calf, so you're squeezing more blood uh, and increasing the venous return. So it, it causes a brief spike in the amount of flow that's going through. If you have the sound turned on in your machine, it'll sound like this. <sighs> And the whew is when you squeeze the calf in an increase in flow. You should also see respiratory variation. Uh, respiratory variation um, is the demonstration that with changes in the respiratory cycle, changes in intra-abdominal and intrathoracic pressure during, air, uh, during inspiration and expiration, you'll see changes in venous return. So at this, with this fine um, uh, venous return sort of pattern here, you can actually see that there's a bit of a wave to it. So a little bit higher. And that's very subtle, um, and, uh, but it's typically visualized better than you can hear it. So you can see here that the wave isn't perfectly flat. So augmentation suggests that um, distal to the area there where you have your probe, you've got uh, a solid column of fluid without obstruction. Because if I squeeze here and I can increase the venous return, nothing should be blocking me here. So from the feet to the 
five, for example, everything should be pretty clear. And if there's not augmentation, it might suggest that the, the pressure is getting buffered out somehow by some obstructive process. That's augmentation. And um, respiratory variation takes you from the point where you're insinating the patient, the point where your probe is held, and uh, more proximal. So if there's respiratory variation, that means that the changes in pressure upstream are being uh, felt at the level of uh, the point where you're doing the insination as well. So changes in the intra-abdominal, intrathoracic pressures are causing changes in venous return. If you lose that, there may be a more proximal clot. So, a clot in the deep venous system of the inferior vena cava or the uh, iliac vessels, for example, can sometimes cause a patient to lose respiratory variation. So respiratory variation suggests that everything proximal to where you are uh, insinating is without clot, and augmentation suggests that everything distal to where you are insinating is without clot. So that's why some people like to use it, but again, the primary focus is with compression. So. Another common thing that you'll find here uh, is what we see in this particular image set. So on the left-hand side here, we see no compression around the level of the common femoral artery and vein, and we can see the artery, the vein, and then this structure here. With compression, the artery gets a little flatter, but it doesn't collapse. The vein collapsed, and this structure is unchanged. And it's pretty common that you'll see this. It's a lymph node, and you can often see um, in large, sort of angry-looking lymph nodes, especially in the femoral region, because um, it's they're fairly pertinent. They're, the lymph uh, structures in the femoral region are pretty pronounced to begin with, and especially in the setting of um, cellulitis, for example, which is one common reason why someone might have a sort of larger edematous leg that you're looking for DVT to begin with. So a lot of the patients you're going to be assessing DVT we're going to have enlarged lymph nodes because their diagnosis is, in fact, an infectious process um, or a lymphangetic process and not just a venous process. So here we see a clot um, artery, vein, and you can really see a little bit of echogenic material inside this vein, so already it's pretty suspect. And then with compression, you see that it does not fully compress. So this patient has a deep vein thrombus. Here again, we see artery vein in the left femoral region and the vein does not collapse. There's a bit of echogenic material in here as well. Very frequently you see it, but, but you don't see it all the time. So again, the lack of compression is really what demonstrates the fact that you have a DVT in that location. Doppler can be used as well to confirm this. Here we see um, arterial flow through the superficial and profunda branches of the femoral artery and no flow within the vein. With a little bit of augmentation, there was a tiny little clip here. Keep in mind, uh, it's outside the scope of this talk to talk at, at length about um, how Doppler works, but uh, red demonstrates flow that's towards the transducer. The legend up here in the top left of the screen on any machine will help you to, um, to remember this. Flow towards the transducer. Again, you're holding the transducer basically at the top of the screen here. Flow towards that direction is red. Flow away from it is blue. Uh, red and blue do not correspond to artery and vein. So here again, we can see vein, artery, and this bright echogenic thrombus that's visible, and the fact that the vein can't compress uh, beyond the thrombus is demonstrated as well in the compression image on the right. So here in real time, we have um, the popliteal fossa. There is the artery here, which is pulsating with a bit of pressure, and the vein fully collapses. So again, we see the uh, vein is on top in the pop. We can see the anatomy. and um, and also, it highlights one way to find the vein. Sometimes the popliteal fossa can be a bit uh, tricky. So if you um, use uh, the gastroc muscle as a landmark, you can usually see sort of a big whirl of muscle tissue, one side of the gastroc, the other side of the gastroc, and then you see the vessels sort of in between here. So vein, artery, and the gastroc whirls on the side. So you can see sort of the midline of the calf in the middle. That's one way to tell. Another way to look for the uh, popliteal vein is to put too much pressure, deliberately put too much pressure, and instead of looking for circular structures using the sort of edge detectors um, in your retina or your brain, you should use the uh, motion detectors because with a bit of pressure, you'll see some pulsation. So put a bit of pressure in the popliteal fossa, look for pulsations, and then once you find the artery and center that pulsation in your screen, release the pressure. 
And what should happen is the artery will start to pulsate less with less pressure and the vein will open up. And that can be another way that you can find um, the vein. It's a good way to find veins anywhere in the body, even for venous access. So here we see an example of the popliteal artery pulsating with a fair amount of pressure being applied to it, popliteal vein, uh, vein above it, no compression. So the, uh, I'm sorry, no, uh, it does not collapse with compression. So the uh, vein is, uh, has a DVT in this particular example. So we're talking mainly about lower extremity clots. And once you get the hang of how to look for compression, um, you can do a couple of different things. One is you can expand the scope of your examination a little bit. Um, if you're not comfortable with the concept that you're only looking at two points, um, you can actually sort of follow the vein a bit, uh, start off with the common femoral vein and compress it and release the pressure, go a little bit more distal, compress it, release the pressure, and follow the vein as, as distal as you can. Um, this way, the, the more of the vein that you're covering, the less likely it is that you'll miss um, a DVT in an area of that vein. So once you get the hang of how to do these DVT studies, it's actually not that difficult to expand a bit beyond the two-point compression technique. Another thing you can do is image other veins. So, for example, we very frequently need to look at the inf uh, internal jugular vein for venous access. And it's definitely worth taking a look at it quickly, making sure it's compressible, essentially checking for a DVT through its visible length before you attempt to cannulate it. It's a rare thing that someone's going to have an IJ clot, but it's not as rare in patients with multiple medical comorbidities, prior um, catheter placements, uh, pacemakers, pick lines, or other uh, foreign bodies in their central venous system. So, um, rather than um, have even the rare case of a complication of trying to cannulate a vessel that's got a DVT in it, you can take what takes literally sometimes only seconds uh, to assess for a clot. So here, for example, on the screen is an example of an internal jugular vein clot. There's a lot of echogenic material inside of the IJ here, and although this image doesn't demonstrate compression, uh, compression proved that there was no collapsibility of the IJ. The IJ should fully collapse anterior to posterior, just as the femoral vein does, just as the popliteal vein does. So a couple of pitfalls in examining the uh, deep vascular system for deep vein thrombus. Lymph nodes uh, may give you the false impression of a DVT. So scan back and forth through the lymph node. A lymph node is going to be a little discrete structure, whereas a DVT or vein is going to be a long structure. So if you can scan past the DV, uh, past a lymph node on both sides and see it disappearing, then you're not looking at a vein and certainly not looking at a thrombus within a vein. And uh, again, some authors argue that you could miss segmental DVTs or calf vein DVTs using a two-point compression technique that we've described during this talk. So uh, certainly it's, it's worth uh, considering the clinical scenario, the pretest probability the patient has a clot, and, uh, and procedures at your own institution, uh, whether this is going to be tolerable for you or not. So there's a lot of different algorithms that have been described in terms of incorporating the use of ultrasound to assess for DVT. And with the incorporation of um, uh, relatively um, accurate D-dimer assessments, um, we actually have some powerful tools to assess pretty rapidly whether a patient has a DVT or not. So um, there, there's a lot of variations on this present in the literature. One option to consider or one series of options is in your low probability patients with a negative D-dimer, you could just be done. Um, in you know, your low probability DVT patient with a positive D-dimer, two-point compression uh, ultrasound can rule out DVT uh, and, and there's several studies that demonstrate the patient can be safely discharged uh, without anticoagulation. Patients with a negative two-point compression technique, this limited point-of-care ultrasound to demonstrate no DVT, should have a follow-up assessment at one week. Several reasons for this. Um, one is propagation of a clot that's already present in the popliteal or femoral vessel uh, could be larger and more demonstrable at a week. And some authors have argued that um, a clot in the calf could have propagated uh, more proximally as well by this point. So something that was not visible prior had propagated up from a more distal source that wasn't even examined previously. Previously. So in your moderate to high suspicion patients, a positive D-dimer, um, you can certainly consider formal study. A lot of authors would, uh, would anticoagulate them uh, as well. And again, a, a moderate to high probability with a negative D-dimer, most people would um, do a, a point-of-care ultrasound. So 
Um, so certainly can aid your decision making at that time, but it's important with a, a two-point compression technique to consider the follow-up options for your patients with negative studies. So more uh, tips and tricks, more tutorials, videos, and other um, goodies are available at sinaiem.us. So please visit that site, take part in, um, in that discussion, and please email me or contact me through the contact form on the website with any thoughts or suggestions. Thank you.